Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, joining this panel. Um, uh, we've got, I think, a really fantastic group of panelists here. Uh, and while the exact name of the panel escapes me, um, we are discussing legal approaches uh, to combating hate crimes. Um, so you're going to hear from uh, practitioners across uh, the spectrum here in terms of um, really some fantastic activity uh, that's underway. Uh, and I think also illustrating, importantly, um, the victim side uh, of of uh, of these cases. Um, and 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 that really is, in a lot of ways. You know how, at least on the civil side, how we get involved in these cases is to to advocate for victims and survivors and to assist them uh, in the process. My name is Justin Herdman. I'm a partner with Jones Day, uh, former United States Attorney in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and I think as you'll hear today, I've worked um, uh, very closely with uh, with Dan and and James in particular on the civil side in my post government career, uh, advocating uh, in the hate crime space for for victims and survivors and. Uh, trying to seek some more systematic and programmatic responses to hate groups uh, through civil litigation. And you'll be hearing about one of the cases um, that James and I are handling together uh, in just a bit. But I, I guess um, to start us off, I'd, I'd ask the panelists to introduce themselves uh, so you get a sense of, of who we've got here and, and how lucky we are here to, to be able to have these folks as panelists. So, um, Sue, I'll hand you the microphone. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. My name's Sue Song. I'm the criminal chief here in the Western District of Pennsylvania U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I'm on this panel because um, from October 27th, 2018, uh, through a jury, jury verdict on August 2nd of 2023, uh, I had the honor to serve as one of the prosecutors on the Tree of Life uh, trial team. Uh, Troy Rivetti, who is also on that trial team, is here, and we're also joined by Bria Jackson and Adrian Howe from our office who were victim specialists who had vitally important roles in that case. I'm a career prosecutor. Uh, I have only ever worked for the Justice Department in some capacity, uh, primarily on violent crimes and, and hate crimes and domestic terrorism. Um, good afternoon, um, or still good morning, uh, everybody. I'm John Quinn. I'm a, one of the founding partners of a firm called Hacker Fink based in New York, a litigation boutique firm. Um, from the beginning, really, our firms had a, a pretty deep commitment to doing public interest work as a big part of our practice. So about a third of our practice uh, is what we describe as public interest work, and it's really guided by you know, the same values that we use to kind of shape the firm itself and really look for both high-impact cases and cases in which we think as a you know, litigation boutique, we can make a unique contribution for whatever reason that might be, whether we're trial lawyers or we're more free to build around a, an individual client and not have to worry about uh, donors and positions or, you know, for whatever reason it might be um, where we think we can make a unique contribution and make a high impact um, on cases consistent with our values. And I'll, I'll talk today principally about two of those. Um, one case that we did back in the early years of our firm in 2017, 2018, uh, to hold the organizers and leaders of the violence and intimidation in Charlottesville accountable, uh, which resulted in a you know, multi-million dollar jury verdict uh, in our favor, which has now survived appeal. Um, and then I'll talk more recently about a case that we did defending a small uh, nonprofit organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate which really focuses on monitoring and exposing and advocating around um, white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and other really hateful and dangerous content online. And they faced a lawsuit from uh, Elon Musk's X Corp, um, which developed a bunch of legal theories essentially trying to silence this organization and hold them responsible for the fact that advertisers have fled uh, the platform. Um, so got that case dismissed earlier this year um, after a very lengthy argument with Judge Breyer out in San Francisco. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about both those cases and really just um, honored to be on this panel and to be here with all of you. It's great to be with everybody this afternoon. My name is James Pash. I am the Senior Director of National Litigation at ADL. Um, for those of you who don't know, ADL was formed in 1913. We have the same exact mission today that we had in 1913, which is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. Um, my start at ADL uh, occurred in this city 
um, as a lay leader or volunteer for ADL, as a look at our board chair, Steve Irwin in the audience right now, who's our, uh, our Pittsburgh board chair, and I, um, I was a member of our board uh, for this region of the country. I live in Cleveland, and um, the morning of the shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue, I received a call from our then director of the office um, to please help gather board members to come down to Pittsburgh to provide any sort of support to wrap our arms around this community in any way that we could. Um, my experiences on the ground as a volunteer leader in the immediate aftermath of that attack um, changed the entire trajectory of my career. Um, a couple months after that, uh, I left my, my work and my practice in Cleveland to join the ADL as a director of the region uh, to cover Cleveland and Pittsburgh and, and Kentucky and West Virginia, and I did that for a few years. Uh, at ADL, we always used to say when I was a regional director, we investigate, we educate, we advocate, but it was very clear over the course of my four years as a director that we weren't using every tool in the toolbox in the fight against hate, and we needed to start litigating. Um, and with that, I, I left the region to form ADL's National Litigation Department. Um, and now we are litigating cases against extremist individuals, extremist organizations from coast to coast and everywhere in between. I look forward to talking about those efforts today. Uh, I'm currently trying multiple cases, both with Dan here to my left and with Justin to my right. Uh, and I look forward to, to talking about those cases because uh, that work at ADL is only made possible by partners uh, at incredible law firms across the country. So um, I want to thank both of you, both of your firms, and um, looking forward to talking about the great work that we're doing together. Off to you, Dan. <laughs> thank you, James. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Kramer. Um, I have uh, two jobs. Uh, I'm a partner at a law firm, Paul Weiss, in New York, uh, and uh, it keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> um, but I also run um, a uh, civil rights group called Center to Combat Hate, uh, and uh, the center, as I'll talk about a little bit later on, brings... Um, uh, impact litigation against extremist white supremacists. Uh, I am delighted to be on this panel. I have a connection with every one of the speakers uh, on this panel. Uh, Justin and I are working on a case um, on behalf of a woman who was severely harassed and doxxed by uh, Andrew Anglin, who's one of the most notorious uh, neo-Nazis in America, the author of The Daily Stormer. And uh, Justin and I are uh, trying to execute on that judgment, and I'll talk a little bit about that. My connection to Sue is a little bit different. Sue was our great hero and uh, uh, in, in bringing to justice the murderer at the Tree of Life, uh, and uh, sh she was in charge of me and my family and making sure that we were t well taken care of. My sister Mary is here today. Her husband Jerry uh, tragically was uh, murdered in uh, Tree of Life, and I'll talk a little bit about what Sue does for a living and does so well and how great her office is. Uh, John who is a wonderful person. Um, my connection is a little bit uh, more remote in that both of our firms were co-counsel in the Charlottesville case. Um, and, uh, and just an epic landmark uh, case and decision in this area where John's and his firm were just fantastic. And uh, James and I, do a lot of, get into a lot of mischief, uh, but the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 I guess, the signature case we're doing is we represent the District of Columbia suing the uh, white supremacists who attacked the Capitol and injured uh, uh, the, all of the uh, law enforcement officers on January 6th. 
and we're litigating that case together to try and uh, bring some relief to the very brave men and women who guarded the Capitol that day. So uh, that's who I am, and I'm just, Justin, so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Dan. Um, so as, as you've heard, you know, and as I know uh, you all know from attending the summit, um, maybe just this year and years past, you know, there's a reason why we're in Pittsburgh, and the reason is, is uh, the Tree of Life, um, uh, the, the horrible uh, attack that occurred there, and, um, you know, all of the, the, the community um, uh, involvement around, um, uh, you know, getting through uh, the prosecution and, and seeing that through to the end. And, and um, I think it's best for us under those circumstances to start with Sue, uh, to talk about that case. Um, it's the case that I think obviously everyone here is familiar with, but I think also just more generally in terms of the way that the legal system approaches hate crimes, we're maybe most familiar with it in the criminal context. Um, you've heard about cases where there are completed hate crimes um, and they've been prosecuted uh, by, by federal state uh, authorities. And, um, and it, it is obviously a very important and, and integral part of the legal system's involvement in these cases. Um, but as you'll hear, it's not the only one. But that being said, um, we'd like Sue to talk a little bit about litigating these cases as a prosecutor and some of the issues um, that arose during the course of the Tree of Life case. Thank you, Justin. Uh, what, what I'm going to describe really is a, is a philosophy and a, a litigation strategy and orientation that we, the trial team, adopted, which was to put the, the victims and survivors at the center of every litigating decision that we made. Uh, that was unique. I think that is a paradigm that, that we have shared with other uh, offices who've had to grapple with mass casualty events, particularly in houses of worship. Uh, but in the process of doing that and adopting that victim and survivor-centric philosophy towards litigation, we were able to obtain some very real and concrete legal decisions that uh, support and uh, assure that the, the victims in this case were able to uh, enjoy the rights that they have under the law. For those of you that don't know, there is a Crime Victims' Rights Act in federal statute, and there are multiple rights that are embodied in federal statute and federal law for crime victims. Uh, some of the most important ones are to be protected from the accused, from the defendant, to have a right to the notice of all the proceedings, and just to give you a sense of the scale in our case, uh, by the time of trial, there were already over 1,000 docket entries uh, that, that people in our office, including our victim advocates, had to assure that the, that the victims had notice of. Uh, there is a right under the Crime Victims' Rights Act not to be excluded from any proceeding. And uh, that sounds very basic, but when you are in a trial context and there are individuals who are going to be witnesses uh, to, the, to the guilt of an individual, Normally, they would have to be excluded from the courtroom, but the Crime Victims' Rights Act recognizes that, that victims should have a different status, and we were very um, fierce in our advocacy uh, for these and other rights for the crime victims. Uh, finally, there, there are rights to be heard and a right to confer with the prosecutors, and we, we tried every day to assure that that meant something and that these were not just words in the statute, but that they, that they had life and meaning uh, to the, the victims and survivors and families. And, and I, I have to note, because I'm sitting here looking at so many of you, um, I, I think that um, the strength of the relationship that we all forged through that trial uh, is, is borne out by how many of you are here uh, to hear what we have to say because you lived it. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to see so many familiar faces. <clears throat> There's a right under federal statute for uh, crime victims to, to enjoy respect for their dignity and privacy. So, so what did that mean in the context of a criminal trial, and in fact in a capital criminal trial? Well, it meant that one of the first things that we secured from the court was a very, very restrictive protective order. What does that mean? That meant that the statements and uh, the images and the, the very graphic evidence that we had to collect in order to prove the guilt of the defendant in this case were protected. And that meant that the defense team could not copy them without court approval. They couldn't be distributed without court approval. And, and that had multiple benefits. First of all, that is the ultimate way to protect the dignity and privacy of the victims in this case. But secondly, because a lot of that material was locked down until time of trial, uh, we were able to fend off 
uh, arguments that the trial should be moved out of Pittsburgh. We were able to select a fair and impartial jury because not all of Pittsburgh and all of the country had seen and heard all of that evidence. So that, that restrictive protective order was, was really vitally important and foundational in our work. Uh, we also obtained protections for uh, the, the victim's medical records and their health condition and any psychological counseling, autopsy reports. Uh, we obtained from the court a trial decorum order, and this had many, many aspects. Um, the first was, as I said, that the, that the victims would be recognized as being able to be present in the courtroom. And we had a very limited trial courtroom. There were only about 40 seats in that trial courtroom. And we got the judge to agree that, that half of those seats uh, were the entitlement of the, the crime victims who wanted to observe it. It wasn't nearly enough, given the demand and the, and the scale and the scope of, of the families that were impacted. Um, but we got half of those seats in that trial courtroom uh, for the victims to rotate in and out of. Uh, also vitally important in terms of assuring that the crime victims could participate in the process and observe the process on their own terms was to have a, a victim courtroom, an overflow courtroom, that was private. And the media couldn't be there, and the defendant's family couldn't be there, and sketch artists couldn't be there, uh, and, and we were able to um, leverage the supports that people needed um, to assure that they could participate in the trial, see the things they wanted to see, step out when they did not want to see things or hear things, and, and having that space within the courtroom, in our view, uh, made, it, made, it, uh, um, made it easier, perhaps, for some of the victims to participate in the process and to see and hear what it is they wanted to hear. Um, there, there was a tension in this case because the, the crimes were horrific and we needed to prove the defendant's guilt. Uh, and to do that, we needed to present some very graphic and disturbing evidence uh, to include 911 calls and, and photos. On the other hand, we needed to preserve the, the dignity and privacy of the families and the victims that were impacted. So on the one hand, we had to argue with the court to allow us to show the jury these images and these, these calls that would help prove the, the guilt and prove the aggravated aspect of these crimes. But on the other hand, uh, notwithstanding the First Amendment and the fact that the court was inclined to have all of the exhibits made available to the public and to the media, uh, we had to try to protect some of those very, very sensitive exhibits. And so we did secure from the court a ruling that uh, while these exhibits were admissible for the guilt phase, that they could not be produced and they could not be shared and they could not be broadcast and they could not be distributed uh, to the media and to the public. And, and that ruling remains intact to this day, which is why some of that most sensitive evidence has never been, been played on the TV or on the radio. And, and so we were very, uh, very focused upon that. We also uh, needed to secure the ability of some of the victims in this case to really bear witness to what happened and, and to talk about the loss that they felt profoundly. And while it might sound surprising, we actually had to argue to present any living images of, of the victims who were killed in this case. Uh, the defense opposed the jury seeing any victims and any photos of the victims in life. Uh, the defense argued against showing any images of those victims, even for purposes of impact, when they were kids or when they were young or, or less than the most recent photos. Uh, so these, these were battles that we fought within court and, and ultimately, while we weren't able to, to get authorization to show the jury all of the images we wanted or all of the images that the families had self-selected uh, as representative to help describe the, the profound loss that they experienced, uh, we did get the court to allow us to show the jury a number of pictures in life. Uh, as, as family members, including Dan, tried to explain to the jury the, the staggering loss that they experienced. Uh, I'll just finish with a, another sort of series of litigation uh, that, that was um, confounding at times, but the defense in this case wanted to send DNA outside of the country to a lab that they had contracted with to include the, the DNA of the deceased victims. And, and we opposed this, and ultimately the court allowed the defense to, uh, to send some of these samples outside of the country, but we did secure agreements uh, that, that that DNA, in the interests of victim privacy, uh, could not be uh, entered into a database, that, that testing to include ancestral or genealogic, genealogical testing that was unrelated to the trial, utterly unrelated to the trial, could not be conducted on those samples. So it was, it was positions like that on uh, every piece of evidence that, that we focused upon 
you know, the, the privacy, dignity, and respect for the, the victims and their families uh, that enabled us to secure some very important court decisions. Um, I know we could, uh, honestly, we could listen to Sue talk for the rest of the hour, um, but she's a rule follower and she literally had a clock going uh, with the <laughs> amount of time that she had left. So um, I really appreciate that, but um, that's exactly what I would expect uh, from our federal prosecutor here. Um, I just want to follow up really quickly on one point that, that Sue made, um, because we really did want her to speak to what's often unseen in many of these cases, which is the way that the U.S. Attorney's Office and the investigative agencies work directly with victims. And it's, it's such an important part of that work. Um, I think you know, feder federal authorities often get criticized that they prosecute victimless crimes, which is, I don't think, true under any circumstances. But I think you know, the fact that there are resources devoted to assisting witnesses and victims and ensuring that they're taken care of is really important. We have some victim witness advocates here in the audience, I heard. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if you get a chance to speak with those folks, they do really phenomenal work. And it's because of people like Sue and, and, and the great folks we have in our U.S. Attorney's offices and investigative agencies who do that work. And to that, to that end, Dan, I think it would be important for us to hear your perspective, not only as, as a litigator, but as, as someone uh, who testified under the circumstances that, that Sue described. Great. Thank you, uh, Justin. And... Uh, I'm not a rule follower or discipline, so I kept so, the mic for a reason. So you're going to have to you're going to have to interject and cut me off. I got it. I got which it. is all good. I will. Which do. is all good. Uh, let me just start by saying thank you, Sue. Thank you to you and your entire team and all of your colleagues. Several of them are here today. It's so good to see all of you. When when Sue says that they did the prosecution with the victims and the victims' families in mind. It's not just a set of um, items that she listed off. It was an incredibly thoughtful and meaningful uh, approach to all of us from the very beginnings, months and months before the trial started. They were available. They uh, uh, explained in lay terms what was going to happen and how things would proceed. They were always available to take questions or, or just be there. They, you know, being a lawyer, yeah, you know, I uh, understood at a certain level what was going on, but when I saw how clearly and sensitively they explained everything. I was just in awe. And from the beginning of the trial through the end, uh, they were uh, there in the breakout room every day, the beginning of the day, to talk through what was going to happen, the end of the day, to get reactions and take questions uh, and be there for people. Um, they made sure that uh, Everyone understood what was going to happen in court in case you wanted to be there, in case you didn't want to be there for any particular part of the trial. Uh, uh, they made it easy for the uh, uh, victims and their families to interact with each other and form a community uh, with each other in the room. Uh, uh, they made it easy for those of us who felt it was important to tell the jury our stories and uh, help prepare us and get us ready for that moment. So from beginning to end, Sue, you in your office, you were just phenomenal, so thank you. And you know, I'm struck, I guess it's been, what, six years now? Yeah, I'm struck by how the events and the trial have affected people and affected them often in a very productive and positive way. I mean, we heard from James in the opening how it changed his career path and put him on a, on a, on a path that I think he would tell us 
is more intrinsically meaningful for him, uh, doing good things in the world. I, I know that's true. I know that in my family, several of my family members uh, have devoted an enormous amount of time to community violence issues, to gun violence issues. Um, uh, both my wife and my oldest daughter have gotten very deep into that. And I know that for me, uh, it, certainly, it certainly pushed me into a new direction. Um, I'm an old guy. I've been, uh, I've been uh, a lawyer for over 40 years. And I've always had the view that it's a privilege to be a lawyer, that um, uh, it comes with an obligation to give back. Some people like Sue, that's her entire career, is, is, is uh, giving back. Uh, for some of us in the private sector, um, it's doing pro bono work and taking time out. John's the same way, although he's sort of in a firm that is more, more the pro bono is more in, in the DNA of the firm. But at my firm, um, we have our billable work, and we take it seriously. We try to do a really good job. But we also take the uh, pro bono work seriously as well. And you know, uh, early in my career, uh, I did a lot of prisoners' rights cases, and, uh, and that was kind of the focus of what I was looking at. But after Tree of Life, and after um, learning more about um, the members of the community that are part of, you know, hate groups and extremist white supremacist groups, I thought, you know, maybe I can um, use my skills, my resources, my firm's resources, and focus on bringing lawsuits to hold um, uh, people who hate accountable. And so I was fortunate. I'm at a firm that has a long history of doing anti-hate work. Um, in the 1930s, the firm represented the Scottsboro Boys in the Supreme Court. Uh, it may not be a case that's familiar to everyone here, but it really uh, was one of the catalysts of the modern civil rights movement. And in the 1950s, we were counsel to Thurgood Marshall and Brown versus Board of Education, a case that's more widely known that overturned the doctrine of separate but equal and really uh, is, in my view, properly viewed as an anti-hate case, uh, given, given uh, all of the law that came out of it. And then more recently, my firm uh, teamed up with John's firm and we uh, did the Charlottesville case and went against you know, some folks who called themselves alt-right but actually are just heinous extremist white supremacists who uh, thought that they could go mainstream with their hateful uh, doctrines. And I think the trial was really, really important for pushing back on that narrative and making it clear that there really isn't room in our pluralistic democratic society for people who uh, not just hold those views, people can hold any view they want, but who act on them. And, and so that was very important. And so I looked at all of these cases around us and the cases the firm did and I went to the firm leadership and I said, you know, why don't we institutionalize? Why don't we really, instead of taking on these cases, and they're important, they're good cases on an ad hoc basis, why don't we really uh, do something where we can have a consistent effort and I think uh, uh, have a bigger impact? So we formed the Center to Combat Hate. Uh, the Chief of Staff, Lizette Duran, is here with us today. I'm one of the uh, 
the uh, co-executive directors. And uh, our, our mission is to uh, hold extremist white supremacists accountable. Uh, we brought a number of cases. We're currently looking into cases with several people, new cases uh, here. And um, essentially, uh, it's an area that the private bar has not really embraced in the way that I think it should and that it needs to embrace. Although I've seen over the last few years more and more large law firms coming in, like Justin's law firm has always been there. Joan Stay has been, has been in several of the key cases. And I think it's just a sad part of the world we live in that um, there are more and more cases to bring along these lines. But I think it's just so important that uh, people who think they can intimidate and harass others because of their ethnic background or because of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, what race they are or, or uh, what religion they practice, they think they can harass them with impunity. The government can't address all these cases, but the private bar can step in. And the private bar can bring lawsuits and can hold people ac accountable and can, I think, make a difference. At least I hope it can make a difference. So I think it's eight minutes. I think I'm at eight, um, eight sure. minutes. Sure. We'll, we'll say it's eight minutes, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, close to eight minutes. Um, um, thank you. That was great. Um, John, um, Dan mentioned the, the Charlottesville case. And I think um, uh, it's been mentioned now at least a couple different times by you and Dan. Um, can you speak a little bit about that case and some of the challenges that were involved there and um, give us an idea of, of what that litigation was like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was it was 2017, August 2017. We all recall the photos of the, the so-called torchlight rally when hundreds of white nationalists marched uh, into Charlottesville on the campus of UVA chanting blood and soil and Jews will not replace us. They surrounded at one point that night 20 or 30 counter protesters who had locked arms around the statue of Thomas Jefferson uh, on campus and maced those people, um, hurled epithets and slurs at those people, intimidated them, at times physically attacked them, and drove those counter protesters away from the statute, at which point defendant Richard, soon to be defendant Richard Spencer, uh, climbed up on the statue and sort of declared victory. And that night, of course, was just the prequel for what happened the next day as hundreds of um, individuals in organizations marched often in uniform, carrying flags in formation, um, again, with organized chants. I mean, it was one thing that became clear the more we all looked at what happened was how organized this was. Um, they led chants. They continued to attack counter-protesters and intimidate counter-protesters all over the city. And of course, at 1.41 p.m. that afternoon, August 12th, defendant James Fields drove his car into a, uh, his Dodge Challenger into a crowd of counter-protesters, killed 32-year-old Heather Heyer, and injured uh, about a dozen more people, four of whom would become plaintiffs. Two of the counter-protesters at the statue would become plaintiffs, as would four of the people in the crowd around Heather Heyer. Um, I mean, I, I was just struck Dan, by what you were saying, I, I, I can recall we were, our law firm was less than two months old. We were literally on folding tables. We had just signed a lease. Watching this unfold and just being so completely struck by it and having all of the arcs of our careers changed by it. I mean, we had founded a firm to do public interest work at an important time, but this became a signal event and, and the biggest case that we, that we filed and that we kind of started that practice within our firm uh, around. What I remember of the next few weeks were having to you know, learn the facts and get this case together and make sure that anyone we were accusing of being a leader, an organizer, that we could tie them plausibly with facts that we had to what happened. And we didn't know very much. A lot of this happens in secret. And I think that'll be kind of a theme in my observations, the importance of transparency in all of this. You know, there, there was a moment, I think, where folks thought, 
uh, you know, people who hold these white nationalist views thought we can kind of go mainstream. You know, we, we can show our faces. We can say these things out loud now. Even still, their planning, the actual communication, the design of these formations all happened in private. And it was really critical, I think, to the success of the case that there was a, a leak in September, so not long after this, September 5th, an organization called Unicorn Riot, a, a kind of media organization, small-scale organization, reported publicly on a leak of Discord servers, Discord being an online platform where all of the, I think it started as a gaming platform, but had been essentially repurposed by these white nationalists. And that's where the planning happened. And they published, I mean, hundreds of thousands of chats. I can remember in our little office with bare bone shelves, row after row after row of binders where we had just printed these out and every one of us just took turns reading them. Horrifying stuff. I mean, the casualness, one, one thing I just remember kind of anecdotally, the casualness with which the, the anticipated violence um, would be woven into conversations. I mean, literally people saying, what's the weather gonna be like that day? What kind of sandwiches are people bringing to the field on Saturday? You know, should we bring, should we bring turkey or is the cheese gonna spoil? And oh, by the way, make sure you like stuff the flagpole with weights so that when you hit people with it, it breaks bones. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring a, a ham sandwich. You know, and, and just casually moving back and forth between these kinds of conversations. But it was through a really rigorous examination of that that we could see this is the planning, these are the people who did it, and, and really document that for purposes of a complaint. The next challenge, of course, was what legal regime all of that fits into, right? We, we knew there'd be a lot of free speech arguments and, and all of that, and people looking to sep distance themselves from any individuals who engaged in specific acts of violence, and really had to kind of dust off the code books. I mean, the, the other thing on the shelf beside the binders were the US code books trying to find the right legal frameworks for this. And ultimately the lead claims were under the federal Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which you know, prohibits acts of intimidation or violence in a you know, racially motivated manner meant to intimidate people, which is of course exactly what happened. But there's, there's a certain drawing on the lessons of history and of the battles this country has fought before there and also a certain creativity, I think, in kind of repurposing some of that and bringing it into the, into the present. And so I, as I think about the case, and you know, of course I could tell the, the long story of all of the defendants' efforts to ignore discovery and all the lawyers that they intimidated out of the case and all of the shenanigans they pulled as pro se lawyers, and I, you know, I applaud the court for its strength in dealing with that, allowing people to be heard, having due process, but seeing the reality of what was going on, making the case work, all of that was critical. But as I really sit back and reflect on it, it was the transparency inherent in what that media organization did. It was some of the battles this country's fought before and repurposing and bringing those forward. Those, I think, were kind of the pillars that, that really made the case uh, work. Um, and I guess if I have a minute, I might, I, I, see, I see echoes of some of these same things. I mentioned this more recent case that we've done just in the past year you know, Charlottesville were obviously on the plaintiff's side. In this case, we were on the defense side. We, we were engaged by a small nonprofit organization, wonderful organization, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, founded and run by a guy named Imran Ahmed after a colleague of his was murdered by a white supremacist who had been radicalized online. Yet another example of one of these events changing the arc of someone's career and causing them to devote just extraordinary effort and talent to this cause. Imran is, is one such person. And the organization monitors what's going on digitally around these issues and writes and advocates about it and became very vocal critics of Elon Musk's Twitter then X. You know, Elon Musk famously replatformed a lot of white nationalists, relaxed content moderation standards, and the platform was flooded with really dangerous, hateful material. And this is an organization that was on that same platform, publishing reports, highlighting this stuff, identifying it. They would identify 100 just horrible, hateful uh, tweets or posts and report all of them and then look back a week later and see what was still there and write a report and push it out and say they're not doing enough and really try to get a lot of attention and did. Elon Musk, of course, didn't like that, called this guy publicly a rat, come, came up with conspiracy theories about his, his funders, you know, tried to stoke investigations, and then ultimately sent them a threatening legal letter. You know, we're coming for you. And we were very happy to uh, write a response to that letter calling it bogus and, you know, and, and more. Um, 
And Imran, of course, being Imran, made both those letters public, knowing full well what would happen and did. They were sued the very next day on a bunch of ginned up claims, the lead one being, oh, when you, when you gathered all those hateful materials that are publicly available on our platform, that was scraping. And scraping is prohibited in our terms of service that you were required to agree to when you signed up on this thing. And the ultimate consequence of your scraping was that all these advertisers fled, so you owe us tens of millions of dollars and we're gonna destroy you. That was the case. Now, I was very happy to argue that to Judge Breyer out in San Francisco earlier this year. We got that thing dismissed. It's up on appeal, very confident in that. But I think there too, I see many of these same lessons. The, the A, it required resources and creativity. You've gotta have clients that will engage as citizens and stand up in the face of a lot of intimidation. You've gotta have creative legal strategies. I mean, Twitter does prohibit scraping. No one really knows exactly what that term means. And if, you, if they get that past a motion to dismiss, they impose millions of dollars of costs on this organization. So you've gotta use state anti-slap laws and smart arguments about damage. Like, and you need a strong judge that can see what's really going on. I see all those things again. But to me, the real through line is this point about transparency, right? Charlottesville couldn't have happened without the transpar transparency and that Discord leak. And this move to just say, oh, if you, if you look at you know, things on our platform and gather them and save copies of them and then talk about them, that's scraping, that's prohibited, and you owe us money and we can drag you through federal litigation. If, if the courts allow that, and X is trying harder every day, they just amended their terms again on this, um, it's a real danger. I mean, we saw ACLU and EFF and Knight and a lot of amazing organizations coming in on amicus briefs to highlight to the court just how dangerous that is if we really, the whole world is moving online. And if we, if we lose the ability to have transparency into what's happening, we're in a dangerous place. So that, that's a big through line that I see in this. And James, maybe picking up on that through line that John mentioned, um, in terms of identifying organizations and trying to seek transparency around structure uh, and participation in, in group activity um, that's designed to result in violence, extremist-fueled violence. Can you speak just maybe a little bit to what ADL is doing in this space and then maybe offer an as-applied uh, version of what the Center on Extremism is doing? Sure, I, I, uh, I assume you made me go last in this all-star panel as like punishment for something I did wrong <laughs> in one of our cases. Yeah, we'll talk about that Okay, after. Yeah. all right, fair enough. Um, look, I think, uh, as, as we all know, uh, one of the challenges in doing this work is, um, is not necessarily identifying harm, right? We, we could see the harm with our own eyes, right? We see the spread of white supremacy, we see the spread of extremism, both on the far right and the far left. We see people being injured, but it's tying that harm to specific individuals and specific organizations that can then give us the ability to fight these battles in court. Um, and so one of the things that we have done at ADL is really build up over a period of years now our center on extremism, where now we have 40 full-time researchers, analysts, and investigators on staff that around the clock are looking into these extremist orgs on, on all sides of the ideological spectrum. And, um, and that gives us the ability um, when incidents occur to identify uh, the hateful actors in real time um, and to, uh, and to uh, really give the ability to create the causes of action. Um, you know, I think uh, there, are, there are two kind of examples I could talk about right now, which is uh, just in the case at ADL and Jones Day, the two of us are doing together against uh, members of a um, organization uh, that has dubbed themselves White Lives Matter. Um, and individuals within that organization that uh, conspired to um, attack a church in Northeast Ohio uh, for uh, that church being uh, an LGBTQ welcoming uh, organization as one of their tenants. And um, uh, that church wound up being firebombed by a member of White Lives Matter with Molotov cocktails. And um, 
our work, and you know, just I think you you would uh, agree with this, but it's the center's work, uh, the Center on Extremism's work, that was able to produce the identification of several of the leaders of that organization, uh, their whereabouts, their activities in the many months leading up to the attack on that church that um, allowed us to produce uh, the complaint in that case um, against uh, the leaders of that org and those that carried out the attack. Um, similarly, you know, working with Dan and, and Paul Weiss in, in the January 6th case, um, uh, against the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers uh, uh, on behalf of the DC Metro police officers that were injured that day. Um, our center's ability to identify um, members of those organizations uh, and, and to um, attach them to the, the actions of that day, um, I think are a vital resource in pressing these cases forward. Um, and you know, I think it's important when we have this conversation to kind of do some level setting about why we've seen a growth in the center on extremism. And it might see, uh, seem abundantly obvious, but I think to put it in to, to context, and um, for those of you who know ADL well, right, you know uh, a large part of our mission is fighting anti-Semitism, right? We've been tracking anti-Semitic incidents in this country since the 1960s in assaults, harassment, and vandalism. And 2023 was the highest year on record that we have seen. And that was pre-October 7th. So like prior to the October 7th attack, we had seen historic highs in this country. Um, and I think you all know uh, that anti-Semitism over the last year has skyrocketed, skyrocketed off of what already was a base high. Um, and so it's really important when we talk about this work to, to frame it in terms of we are seeing historic amounts of hate, right? When I go home to the city I grew up in, in New York City, I, I see marches with uh, Hamas and Hezbollah flags in the city, right? Like designated foreign terrorist organizations. Um, we brought a case uh, this summer with Kroll and Mooring we represent 150 victims of the October 7th attack. Um, and we brought that case against Iran and, and Syria and North Korea for providing material support to Hamas to commit that terrorist attack, right? And when we start talking about extremism and the growth of hate, um, that international hate that we're seeing has certainly transported itself into our nation and we're seeing it from coast to coast. And so there's not a shortage of work to be done. Um, that's why I'm so grateful that I'm on a panel of people that have committed themselves to doing this work. Um, and we are, we're, we are only seeing a growth of anti-Semitism and hate. And so it's really incumbent on all of us uh, to use whatever our professional skills are uh, to fight back against it, to push back. Uh, with every fiber of our being. Um, and so whether you are a researcher, whether you are a professor, whether you are a lawyer, whether you are a teacher, we need all of you um, uh, in this fight. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't be kind of more thankful to be a part of it. Um, I, I always, uh, you know, tell people that I'm close with, um, I think I have the best damn job in the country, right? Because I get to spend my career uh, pushing back and fighting back against those who are purveyors of hate, those that um, uh, do carry out uh, acts of hate. And when, uh, when they cross over that First Amendment barrier into legally actionable um, uh, crimes, um, ADL uh, will be there along with our colleagues uh, to greet them uh, each and every time with a lovely civil complaint. Uh, and, and, and don't, don't get me wrong, these, these complaints have a significant deterrent effect. Not just the verdict at the end, right? But, uh, I mean, we've seen it, Justin, in our White Lives Matter case. I mean, that group went dormant, right? Because 
shockingly, there's not a lineup of pro bono attorneys to defend white supremacists. Um, and, I mean, there might be some, uh, but uh, there's not an overwhelming amount. And, uh, and you know, uh, like, you know, I think one of them has a GoFundMe page. Um, and I think, you know, uh, litigation itself is an expensive endeavor and puts a lot of pressure on these organizations and on these individuals. Uh, and uh, I certainly hope it provides maybe a deterrent effect for those who are thinking about joining those organizations um, that uh, it will invite a trouble that they cannot afford uh, to be invited into their lives. So uh, hopefully little by little here uh, in the pushback, um, we're providing a necessary deterrent. Yeah. And uh, the deterrence effect is important. That's why these cases, in large part, we can bring these cases and we want to bring these cases. Um, but we want to deter the bad guys and we want to encourage the good guys. So to that end, and with James' point there about needing help in these cases, I just wanted to advertise at 1 o'clock uh, in room 315, we are going to have a little workshop event on um, assisting on the pro bono networking side in these cases. And it's not just legal practitioners, although you're, obviously we need lawyers. We really need everybody. And any sort of expertise that you can bring to bear in the fight is essential to us. We need expert witnesses in these cases. Um, we just need overall you know, support as well. Um, so please, if you're at all, in, and I expect many of you are inspired by what you've he heard here today, um, please join us at 1 o'clock, room 315, uh, for that, that networking session um, on these types of cases. Um, uh, so we're going we're gonna to transition quickly with the time that we have left to the future, but I just wanted to follow up on one point that I, I think Dan made very well, which is these groups, they seek out what they think are vulnerabilities. They think that there's some permission structure that they can use in our overall society to attack groups that they've perceived as vulnerable. And I think to James' point, they are opening up a whole host of allies to the groups that they thought were vulnerable, right? So our, our client, the Community Church of Chesterland, the one that was firebombed, you know, this is, it's a church that, you know, I'm Catholic, it doesn't look like my church, it doesn't look like the churches that, that maybe I, I grew up around, even though I grew up in this, in this neighborhood, but that's not the point. The point is, this is what they believe, this is their faith community, and it was attacked, and attacked in a way that the guys that did it thought that they could get away with it because these people were politically unpopular, or vulnerable in some way. And we have to keep doing this work that we're doing because it's demonstrating to the people that think that they can get away with this that they can't. That there's not just criminal penalties involved, but there are civil penalties. And by the way, those, those cases go for far longer than the criminal cases, uh, as I think you know, Sue would tell you that that, um, that that would be her expectation too. So I just, wanna, I just wanted to follow up on that point because I thought it had been made very well by a couple of the panelists. Um, and I also want to, I, I wanted to inject a little note of hope here because I'm about to ask our panelists about what to expect in the future, and particularly in the near future, and I, I don't know that it's going to be as rosy uh, <laughs> as what I just relayed to you guys. So I wanted to have some sort of hope to, to at least uh, bake into the end here. So um, I guess I'd go just maybe down um, uh, the, the row here. Uh, well, actually, let's start with you, Dan. What are, what are you looking at, kind of, you know, in, in terms of what your center is going to be focused on and, and what you see? Um, maybe just a minute or two on, on what you see in the future and where you want to be positioned um, going forward here. Sure, thank you. Uh, and I'll be brief about this, but before then, I neglected to say that the case against Andrew Anglin was brought by Southern Poverty Law Center. And so, we have to give a shout out to our friends at Southern Poverty who do a phenomenal job. Having said that, uh, so we're looking at a number of things now, but um, here's my concern. Uh, it's not unique to me and it's something I'm sure uh, people have thought about a fair amount. Uh, either way this election goes, first week in November, um, I think we're going to see an uptick in uh, bad behavior. Um, if one of the candidates is elected, it's very likely that the January 6th insurrectionists will be pardoned. And that will put
put on the streets a lot of very bad people and send a terrible message. And if the election goes the other way, there'll be um, a large group of people who notwithstanding whatever the evidence is, will believe it was a rigged result. And I'm not saying we're gonna have another January 6th, but I think we will have um, events where folks act out. And so I think that's what we foresee in the next couple of weeks, is one way or the other, um, we're gonna sadly, uh, I think, have an uptick in, in um, hate-based behavior and you know, we need all the resources we can get to um, try to react to it. Unfortunately, much of what we do is reactive, and and that's how I see it. John, how about you? What are you um, on the lookout for? I mean, I, I certainly agree with all of Dan's comments. I mean, I, I as I mentioned before, very focused on this transparency fight that I think we're really in very centrally right now. I mean, that the world has moved online. These online tools have given white nationalists and, and other really dangerous folks really powerful new ways to connect, to communicate, to organize, to radicalize more people. These are really, really powerful tools. AI is around the corner to supercharge them. And they are largely in the hands of private companies that can put, can, you know, bring the gates down and prevent us from seeing what's going on. And we're only going to be able to deal with the power of those tools on the on the other side if we've got transparency and visibility into it. And I see that as a very kind of multidisciplinary fight. We lawyers can make our arguments case by case, but there is advocacy and organizing and just all sorts of work that has to go into this fight for transparency in the digital sphere around all of this. I, I think the, the one other thing I'm, I'm seeing on this panel and that I, I sort of anticipate more going forward is just the synergies and the collaboration. I mean, Dan mentioned our firms paired up for the Charlottesville case. We were the new kid on the block. They're one of the most you know, storied, legendary law firms in the world with a century-long commitment to this. And so we, we teamed up and we did that case together and I don't think it could have happened without both firms totally committed to it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking too about the criminal side and some of Sue's comments. You know, the, the new DA in Virginia has brought charges against a lot of these people, finally. And so our plaintiffs, we, we're still sending folks down to Charlottesville to prep our plaintiffs to go in and testify in criminal proceedings and just got the first guilty verdict, I think, last week uh, on one of these. So there's that civil criminal collaboration, ADL, as you know, has been mentioned, partnering with multiple law firms on a lot of these issues. And we've already referred to SPLC, ACLU, EFF, Knight. I mean, so there's a lot of collaboration and synergy happening and it, it is one way to muster strength and meet all of this. And I think that's you know, going to be necessary too from everybody in this room and at this conference. It's what this conference is really about. So I think that's the other thing that I see going forward is like that deeper collaboration. James, for you and ADL, what are you, what are you looking uh, to the future? What do you see? I mean, look, I, I, I'm an eternal optimist, so I'd like to leave <laughs> you know, like, you know, with, with, with some hope here uh, uh, in spite of, I think, the, the, the negative environment. I think one of the things... Um, that we could we could all and I touched on this kind of in my earlier remarks about needing kind of a whole of society approach in the fight against hate and the fight against anti-Semitism. Um, one of the things I think we're going to need to do in the coming years is we're going to need people to be um, unafraid in speaking out within their own ideological and political tents, um, no matter what side of that spectrum you fall into, right? If you consider yourself a Republican, speak out against the right-wing extremism that you're seeing. If you consider yourself a Democrat or a liberal, speak out against the left-wing extremism that you're seeing. The extremism uh, is not good uh, for this nation. And when those that are vulnerable among us uh, get used as um, uh, political wedge issues, um, uh, we are the ones who lose. Um, uh, and the only people who gain from that type of discussion are the extremists. And so uh, be, be unafraid, uh, and um, your voice might be needed in your own circle uh, now more than ever. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, the, as far as the legal challenges 
are concerned and the way that we view it from the ADL lens uh, is we will also attack it wherever and whenever we see it, no matter who the victim and no matter where the hate is coming from on the ideological spectrum, right? So uh, whether it's in court against uh, a white supremacist group, whether it is in court uh, against a university because students on campus uh, have been physically assaulted, uh, right? We're gonna kind of take that battle um, and, and fight it wherever we see it. Thank you. And Sue, maybe we'll close with you. I know there's a lot, obviously, you can't share, but in terms of you know, what you're seeing and, and where you expect to be um, uh, in the future here from, from DOJ and, and the U.S. Attorney's Office perspective, what, what are you seeing? Uh, thanks, Justin. What I would say is that if we continue to be aggressive in prosecuting hate-fueled violence, which we intend to be, uh, we as prosecutors and law enforcement have to bring a new dimension to the crime victim's right to be protected from the accused and those who harbor views like the accused. And I will just give an example uh, that crystallized this is in the midst of the Tree of Life trial. Uh, there was an in individual from Pittsburgh, notorious, virulent, anti-Semitic and white supremacist individual named Hardy Lloyd, who was actively threatening the victims in our case as well as the jurors uh, online. And so all in the background, as, as we were staging the trial, there was a, a very aggressive investigation into this individual who pled guilty and was sentenced to six and a half years. But um, it would have compounded in uh, just dramatic ways the, the potential harms and violence if the people that we needed to bear witness in our case uh, were under further threat of violence. And so I think as prosecutors and law enforcement, we have, have to bear that in mind and keep people safe. Well, I, I just want to, I know uh, the, the audience here, I am sure I know shares this, but I want to thank all of our panelists, not only for speaking to us here today, but for all the great work that you guys are doing and will continue to do. Thank you guys so much. It's an honor to know you and, and to be working with you. Thank you.